Katie. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Discovery, Discovery Channel. Today we will be discussing medieval European arts. The time is 1300 AD and arts are a crucial part to Europe's culture. To help you learn about the Middle Ages, we have brought in experts to talk about each of the topics. First, we have a special guest star, Arpita Kamrar, here to talk to you about the physical arts. You're on, Arpita. Medieval Europe was basically a breeding ground for some of the greatest artists this world has seen. Many of these artists were discovered by the Medicis. The Medicis were the leaders of Florence. They supported culture and the arts and transformed Florence into the cultural hub of Europe. Artists discovered by the Medicis lived in the Medici household among nobles and other young prodigies. Artists discovered by the Medicis included Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Ghiberti, and Botticelli. Among one of those names mentioned is Da Vinci, one of the most famous artists of all time. He was born in 1450 to a lawyer and his peasant wife. Why were they drawn to Florence? He, like many other artists, was drawn to Florence due to his reputation for discovering prodigies. Soon after his arrival, he was employed by Verrocchio, a sculptor for the Medicis. Under his guidance, he began experimenting with mixing his pigments with oils versus the traditional egg. He was the first artist outside of Northern Europe to begin experimenting with this technique. How does this technique influence other arts? It pretty much transformed the art world. However, this technique was not successful when it came to frescas. When he tried to paint one, the paint practically slid off the wall. Today, you can still see the remnants of his intricate war scene. So, to even further your knowledge, Arpita has recreated a panel from the Gates of Paradise on a canvas to show you the details of medieval paintings. While Arpita gets that set up, we will discuss the European musical trends during the late Middle Ages. Please welcome Jessica Maduro. So Jessica, we were wondering what the first piano was. Thank you, Katie. Well, the real start to professional music began in the Middle Ages. Right after the harpsichord was invented in 1397, music changed and spread throughout Europe, Asia, and France. What was the music like back then? Well, music during this time period was mainly polyphonic, which means that many different melodies occurred at the same time. But really, by many, it's meant to be two, because each hand will play its own melody. This technique is called a call and response. Can you compare the musical advantages from now and back then? Okay, so the first topic I'll talk about is sheet music. Sheet music refers to the printed musical notes and articulations that are printed on a page to allow musicians to read how the composer wanted the piece to be interpreted. Without sheet music, it would be very difficult to understand how a piece should be played. So the first printing of sheet music was in 1501, but before that, people had to either memorize music or just copy someone else. How did this influence music? Well, the printing of sheet music greatly influenced the expansion of music from harpsichord. Because right after 1501, sheet music that was printed made it actually accessible for people to learn the harpsichord without having to copy other people or see an example. So Jessica has decided to play a song for you to help you learn about the music in the Renaissance. Written by Johann Sebastian Bach, this song sounds very old-fashioned. Now, listen to the other melody. By itself, one hand could be the entire piece. Each hand has its own unique melody. Now, we are going to talk about the clothing styles in the Renaissance. Please welcome Jaina Elkins. Thank you, Rena. I will be talking to you about the distinct change in clothing styles. Now, in the middle of the Renaissance was a period from 1450 to 1624 called the Renaissance Splendor. This was a period when the loose and unfastened changed to supportive and stiff. In this change, men had a hose with a fitted doublet and an outer coat. The woman had a bodice piece and a separate skirt. There are many new additions in this time period. Since the clothing had a theme of stiff and supportive, they often had to have more parts to their attire. The temple sleeves, under and over skirts, sleeveless jerkins, and breeches of different lengths. Men of the muscular form had clothing of enhanced wide shoulders, prominent cod pieces, strong legs and bellies. The woman's clothing focused on narrow waist, wide shoulders, and skirts with more defined bonnets. 
between 1450 and 1470 first became fashionable and were the prerogative of royalty. That's really interesting. What did they do with their hair? Woman's hair was pulled back from the forehead and covered by a small bat worn over a bun at the back of the head. Fashionable women shaved their foreheads and eyebrows. In Italy, married women wore long hair, braided in loose knots and uncovered. Weaving techniques improved and brocades became a luxury fabric. The best fabric comes from Italy with Chinese, Indian, and Persian motifs reflecting increased trade with these countries. How fascinating! Jaina will be back with us later, but now let's go to our theater expert with a lovely name, Coppelia Cortland. Hey guys, so there's so much to talk about when it comes to medieval European theater that I could go on for hours. But today we're just going to focus on the development of theater's popularity in Europe and the people who contributed to its rise. So the Renaissance was simply a time when the theatrical arts blossomed and thrived. But before people like Shakespeare arose, theater wasn't that popular. So at first, small nomadic groups of people would travel around and perform wherever there was an audience. These bands of people consisted of a variety of different entertainers such as storytellers, jesters, jugglers, and many others. Because traveling performances were considered sinful, the Catholic Church tried to extinguish these acts and convert the entertainers. That makes sense, but I've heard that the Catholic Church was also a helping hand in reviving theater in Europe. How exactly does that work? Yes, well, instead of performing random acts of entertainment, the Catholic Church decided to form their own type of theater. So, what they would do is, during church services, they would perform dramatized versions of Bible stories. And eventually, these performances became so popular that they could not fit everyone in the church, so they moved outside. But despite the less formal setting, the church still saw it as a religious event and not entertainment. Very interesting. So what were some of the stories that were dramatized? The most popular play that was dramatized at the time was the story of Mary visiting Christ's tomb after his resurrection. Stories such as Jesus' crucifixion, however, were rarely dramatized. At one point, people began to go off and write their own plays, but in order to keep control, the Catholic Church still reserved the right to approve these performances before they were actually performed. Okay, and one last question. Who was the best playwright and why was he so special? Okay, well the best playwright of the Middle Ages would obviously be Shakespeare. Shakespeare is arguably one of the most renowned playwrights of all time. Due to the lack of information that we know about Shakespeare's life, it is hard to say exactly how many works he wrote. However, it is estimated that he wrote 37 plays and 154 sonnets. We do know, however, that Shakespeare's father was John Shakespeare and that he had five siblings, two sisters, and three brothers. We also know that he was married to Anne Hathaway on 5th, November 28, 1582, and that he had twins. Thanks, Coppelia. Now let's go back to our art specialist, Arpita Kanra, who has prepared the painting for us. Hey guys, sorry that I couldn't meet you at the studio, but here it is. This is The Gates of Paradise by Lorenzo Ghiberti. The Gates of Paradise sits on the east facade across from the Florence Cathedral. Although not exactly in the 1500s, Ghiberti is considered a Renaissance artist. In 1401, Florence held a competition to see who was the best sculptor in Florence because they wanted to remake the doors to the baptistry. He was up against Filippo Brunel Leschi. While the other contender drafted his plans behind closed doors, Ghiberti took a different route. He held a public workshop where the citizens and nobles of Florence could give their input on his plans. This approach allowed him to win the competition. Wow, that is smart. Ghiberti spent over 20 years toiling over the panels, making and remaking them until they were just right. After he had accomplished this, they hired him to make the doors to the east facade. He spent another 24 years toiling over this piece. It contained many depictions of Bible stories and brought a sense of breathtaking realism to them. Thanks, Arvita. We hope you enjoyed episode two of the Discovery Channel. I'm Rena. And I'm Katie. See, See you next week. week.